You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. Parasearch Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch Radio. Hello, everybody, and hello to those who have braved the non-football airwaves. I do apologise. I know England is still playing at the moment, and... um, I'm sorry that if you're listening to this, you're either getting in trouble with your loved ones for not w- sort of watching the football with them or whatever your reason for choosing me over them is. But I do appreciate it. I do appreciate it. You not leaving me here all on my all on my own. Um, when I left, it, I think England had just gone to extra time. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But thank you for thank you for anyone who joins us. And if you're listening to this on catch up. Obviously, I don't know what the result is, but I hope it wasn't one that you were too you were either you were either very happy about or not too disappointed about. Does that cover everything? Hope so. Hope so. Anyway, yes, it's Penny. It's Haunted Histories time here on Parasearch Radio. How are we all? What have we been up to apart from possibly watching the football? Well, last week's show. The Death Car. Did you ever listen to it? I know from the title you probably thought that's not going to be that interesting, but I promise you, those people who listened did find it very interesting. So if you haven't had a listen to that, go and have a go and have a ganders. Go and have a listen when you've not got anything else to do. YouTube. Hi, Mark. Yeah, you might be the only person here at the moment, Mark. So come on, get people get people to dial in for me, so it's not just us. They'll gossip, you know. They'll gossip. So, what else? Well, we've got another competition running at Parasearch. This one's going to be drawn on the 22nd of July. And it's a chance to win one of our good friend, Ashley Nibb, who I did the show on Peterborough Museum with, to win one of his Paranormal Investigators journals. You know what to do. Go to the page, like the thing, share the thing, write your name down on it, and you'll be in for a chance to win it. Got to be in it to win it, people. In it to win it. What else have we got going on before I start the interview? Oh, yes, YouTube. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel yet? We haven't put those videos up, I keep promising. They are in the pipeline. They really are. It's just a matter of getting them sort of edited and all that that kind of thing. There's a lot of them. A lot of them to do. But once they're ready, they'll be going up. There's going to be some new blogs going up on the website soon. I've written one. All about the she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella between you and me. So that will be going up soon. And yeah, it's all been busy, busy. There some cracking guests on the shows the last few weeks. On all the different Parasert shows. And I hope you've been enjoying those. Everyone's been working really, really hard. Kerry, Kaz, Paul, Mark, Claire. All of them have been working really, really hard to bring you some cracking shows. What else am I up to? Well, this week I'm going to revisit one of my favourite locations that I actually first did with uh, one of the first times I met Paul Rook, actually. Drake Low Tunnels down in Worcestershire. And I'm going to be investigating there with the uh, Jessica Gladwin of Dust Till Dawn events. Looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to that one because I love that place, both from the history side and pretty much everything else. But tonight, without further ado, I'm going to start playing out the show. We've got about an hour's worth of material here that I recorded with Mike and myself, and we probably could have gone on for quite a bit longer if we'd tried. But, you know, we thought we'd behave ourselves and stick to the hour. So 
I hope you enjoy. Let me know what you think. Okay, so on tonight's Haunted History... Now, you know I love all of my guests I get on. I... I oh, the, the diversity and sort of variation of guests that I get on is absolutely brilliant. But tonight I have on someone who has got my dream job. Not only is he a history guru... He is also uh, a published author of, I think, 16... Was it 16 books, Mike? 16 books. 16 books, yeah, 16 books. And he's a TV star. And he's just a generally nice guy all round. Mr. Mike Covell of Hull fame. How are you, Mike? I'm fantastic, thank you. Good, good. Well, thank you ever so much for joining us on this, this show. I've, I've called the Enigma of Hull because I thought that leaves it quite open as to where the conversation might possibly take us. <laughs> um, anyone who sort of knows me knows that I, I do like to sort of quiz, quiz people and learn new stuff. And I've been, Mike and I have been chatting for about three quarters of an hour before we started recording this show, because to meet someone who is as, as bonkers about history as I am, is, um, it's always a treat because we can exchange stories and talk about different things. And, um, Yes, it's good. It's good to learn. It's good to learn. So now, Mike, your history guru is probably an apt term for you. History nerd, whatever, whichever way you want to go with. I say nerd for myself because I don't think I'm a guru, (laughs) but I've not been published yet. So, you know, you're one step up from me. Um, But a a, a passionate fan of all things historical is probably another way of looking at it. Now, you're not sort of, it's not that you've come out of Oxford or Cambridge with a history degree and went into it at 21, is it? You have you had a sort of a career before you became yes. a history nerd. Yeah, but I worked in full-time uh, employment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was working in retail. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was a retail manager and basically what had happened was I got diagnosed with a critical heart condition. Right. I had to give up full-time employment and I needed a hobby, really. Um, when you work full time and then you know you come into nothing, yeah. there's kind of a space there that needs filling. Yeah. So I started researching and I started writing and I started reading just about everything I could get my hands on relating to sort of the history of Hull um, and sort of the dark side of the history of Hull. And during that time, I had a couple of art operations. I eventually got the all clear. And by then, um, you know, I'd finished writing the books, they were ready for publication. Um, so I set up my own company called Amazing Hull Tours. Mm-hmm. Um, initially, it was just going to be a tour guide company where we were going to offer ghost walks and history tours around the city centre. But it just took off from there, really. I published three books uh, within the first week of trading. Mm-hmm. Um, I then got a company from Hollywood get in touch saying they wanted to buy the rights to those books. Mm-hmm. Uh, they then offered to buy the rights to an, a couple more books. Um, off the back of that, I ended up getting a full-time publisher uh, who was just looking at one of my manuscripts this morning. Um, <laughs> and we've never looked back, really. And then it, it kind of exploded from there. One thing led to another. I ended up working with a lot of paranormal groups and built up quite a reputation. And eventually, I managed to do a... a I had a private tour with uh, Yvette and Carl mm. from most of them. And we became really close. We became good friends. They were obviously interested in what I do. Uh, Cal Beatty is a massive fan of true crime, mm-hmm. so we spent ages talking about some of the research that I've done on certain true crime cases, and we eventually filmed together, um, we recorded Most Haunted, uh, Most Haunted itself at Anison's several years ago, mm-hmm. and off the back of that we did a couple of Most Haunted Experience events together, um, and then I just sort of said to Carl one day, you know, if you ever need anyone for you know the show, just give me a shout and You know, I'm always happy to help out and and work on the show and stuff like that. And a few days later, he called me up and said, would you like to work on Most Haunted Lab? Mm. Um, So I jumped at the chance. That went out from 30 uh, East Drive Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some years ago. And it just exploded from there, really. And, Mm. uh, you know, I've never really looked back. I ended up working on Paranormal Lockdown with Nick Groff, Mm. uh, the Weedman. Where was that? You did Paranormal Lockdown? What? Which again, that was from East Drive. That was East Drive again. It was a special they did between Series 1 and Series 2. They had this big special. Mm. Uh, and that was that was great because, I mean, Nick is such a funny character. Is he? You know, you see him on the show and he's quite serious and stuff like that. But he's just a typical bloke, you know. And the first time I met him, uh, 
he, he'd obviously read quite a lot of my research before I'd got there. Oh, wow. And I you know I was working with him. I was just told that there was a private car coming to pick me up and drive me all the way to Pontefract. How far is Pontefract from Hull, then? Uh, oh, it's, it's a couple of hours' drive. Is it really? Oh, okay. Yeah, about an hour and a half you're looking at to get there. Um, so this, this big, lovely black car comes and picks me up, takes me to Pontefract, drops me off at the All Saints Church, and there's no one there. So I kind of escaped and went and got a, a sandwich and I was heading back to the location and my telephone went off and it was the producer and she said, we're here now, we're ready to start shooting. Um, so I rushed back um, to the church, walked up towards the church and Nick Roth was stood in front of me, you know, and I, I like everyone, I love ghost adventures. So I'd seen him on that previously. Mm. I'd watched the first series of Paranormal Lockdown, so I knew what it was all about. Um, and I walked up to him and he... he said to me you must be Mike the historian which blew me away because obviously you know you think well this this guy's not going to know who I am mm. uh, I just immediately hit it off we spent the rest of the shoot just kind of laughing and giggling about stuff and um, and Katrina as well she's really into the Jack the Ripper mystery so we kind of hit yeah. it off straight away yeah and so is Katrina as beautiful as she seems on telly fantastic do you know is what she? she's a yeah she's so nice and the two of them, I don't know how they get any work done because they have such a great re- relationship on screen. Yeah. When they're on set, they are so funny. And, you know, the first sequence we shot was an introductory scene where they're walking up to me and we have to shake hands. And Nick had to basically say to me, um, hi, and I had to say to him, you know, good morning or whatever. And um, Nick walked up to me and he dropped a bit of a, uh, a little line in there to try and make me laugh and put me up and he said to me do you often hang around in cemeteries on a weekend so i said to him um yeah it's my job it's my full-time job <laughs> and that was it we were both giggling and you know katrina was like god you two you know grow up and, and <laughs> with that, like, that again that again and then um, you know we, we just immediately hit it off and we had such a great show and it was a, it was a beautiful sunny day yeah that, a cloudless sky and it was just really really nice to be able to film and and then off the back of that i got a lot of work with i did some work on a, a tv show called uh which was basically it was about it was from the bbc it was about the blitz yes um and on that particular show i did all the research in the background i did a lot of work at the history center research and, and this is the show. blitz the bombs that changed britain that show yeah, well, yeah. It, it was basically uh it went out on bbc um two. bbc, BBC two. Two, yeah mm. uh Oh, November, December time last year. That's right, yeah. Uh, really popular. <laughs> I um, watched it. I watched the whole series. <laughs> I loved it, you know, and it, it was a very dark project to work on, as you can imagine. Yeah. yeah. But great fun uh, at the end when, you know, you see the end product and fantastic to hear everyone's kind of um, feedback. You know, people mm. people were in tears watching mm. the show. I was, and, I was. You know, we, we were in tears filming the show. Mm. Um, to say that every day when we were on set, we were giving it a hundred percent to make sure that the story was told and still and told properly, yeah, uh, the correct way that was respectful. And I remember some days turning up on set, and by the end of the day, we were all physically and emotionally drained. But then you know you've done it. You've you've you know you've you've come to do what you wanted to do, what you you was asked to do, and it was just a great project to work mm. on. It was. It was uh, you know, I really enjoyed it. Mm. And then off the back of that, I ended up working with the uh, Paranormal Truth guys on a TV show called Ouija, Dice in the Death. Mm. Um, that was filmed at uh, DeGray Street in Hull. Uh, mm-hmm. I was a historian and I, I was called into kind of debunk all the nonsense made up about the property. Mm. Um, I also worked on Vice TV on a TV show called The Beast of Barmston Drain, uh, which was our search for the seven-foot werewolf in Hull. You wrote uh, a book on that all... as well, haven't you? I have, yeah. I yeah. wrote a book on that one. Um, I was also filmed for a TV show um, for the Travel Channel, which is not yet aired. Um, and this was a pilot for a TV show about sort of cryptozoology and, and strange mm-hmm. animals. And they came to film on the Beast of Bounce and Drain. And we spent the full night on the drain from, from sunset to sunrise. Um, and it was, again, it was a great shoot. We filmed over three days. Um, it was such a lovely weekend. And um, yeah. Recently, I filmed with Suggs uh, on his World War Two TV show, World War Two Treasure Hunters. Now, uh, anyone yeah. who doesn't know who Suggs is, apart from shame on you, um, <laughs> he's the singer from the band Madness, Baggy Trousers and all of that fame, I suppose you could say. 
yeah, he's just crazy. He's just such a lovely guy. You know, I was really nervous going into that one because you know, I, I, working with someone like Sucks, you don't know what to expect. And I've mm. I'd seen the first series of the TV show, so I knew kind of the work they do and and things like that. And I just went with a completely open mind. Yeah. And got there, the, the director said, right, this is what we're looking for. Um, you know, and we got it all on the first take. Yeah. Um, it was great, you know. And after that, they, they want to do, um, they want to get overall shots and, you know, things like that, cutaways and stuff. So me and Suggs kind of just went off for a wonder uh, on our own and we were chatting about uh, Hull and its history and our families and all sorts. And we just did it off, you know, such a nice guy. And then for one scene, we had to we had to drive through Hull from one location to another. Uh, we're just me and Suggs in the car, and we just had such a laugh. He's such a great guy, you know. Mm. And uh, you know, it's quite dark, serious matter that we covered. Uh, yeah. It, it was World War Two, but I was telling him a few other stories that happened at the time as well, and you know, he found them quite enjoyable, and you know, it was a great film. Mm. And you you were telling me there was there was well, let's let's talk about the the one where your camera fell off. Uh, well, basically, um, <laughs> and say the one... backstory to what what he was. Yeah, the, the, I'll, why I'll, the I'll... camera fell off? <laughs> uh, we, were, we were filming in the car, but the camera stuck to the front of the car, and we were heading towards um, right down Ferrens Way in Hull. And Ferrens Way was one of those places that was quite badly hit in mm. the May nineteen forty one raids. And one of the properties that was destroyed was a place called Hammond, and Hammond's was a big department store. And um, basically, when during the outbreak of war. They built a an 800 place um, basement level, which had uh, room for 800 people mm. um, to shelter in. And when it took a direct hit, the building kind of fell in on itself, and mm -hmm. all the stock fell into the basement. So when the fire brigade turned up with the hoses, the basement filled with water, um, and the company started trading almost the next day. They kind of washed all the clothes off and set up a, a, a shop. Um, a makeshift shop on a couple of banks of wood and, and the other. And one of the great stories I heard was that the morning after this raid, the gen this gentleman was coming down Annalaby Road towards the city centre, and there was lots and lots of black charred bodies at, at the roadside. So he got off his push bike and he took his cap off and he's got his cap on his chest and he's paying his respects. And this road sweeper comes along, you know, and he's he, he's got his black cap on and he's brushing the road and he, he says to him, "What are you doing?" And he says, well, I'm paying my respects to these, these victims. And he says, you idiot. He said, these are the mannequins from Hammond. <laughs> so I was telling this story to Suggs, and when I got to this, this, you know, true story, but when I got to this punchline, um, Suggs started laughing and we slammed on and the camera fell off the car. <laughs> and uh, We didn't even realise, you know, this guy who was just passing on the road, knocked on the car window and handed the camera through. <laughs> uh, it was such a, you know... We was telling little stories like that and, and things, you know. We went to a theatre that was bombed during the war. Yeah. And one of the films that was being shown at the time um, was The uh, the Great Dictator. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there was stuff like that. There was also an incident involving my grandfather during the war. When his house got bombed, um, my uh, grandfather was in the shelter at the back of the garden. Yeah. Um, and after the, the bombing, they went into the front win the front room and the window was all smashed out. There was wooden debris everywhere. And the whole Daily Mail reporter was walking down the street with his camera. And he sort of stopped and said, how do you feel about, you know, what's gone on overnight, the, the, the devastation, the destruction? And my grandfather put his thumbs up and laughed. And his photo was taken at that exact moment. So there's a picture of my granddad in this bombed out building with his thumbs up smiling. <laughs> and they used that in 1941 on the front page of the whole Daily Mail. Uh, it was used right throughout the war and featured on a number of books about Hull's history. And then, um, you know, I was kind of telling Suggs this story and saying, you know, even though all hell was breaking loose across the city, yeah. this, this picture of my granddad in the middle of all this rubble with his thumbs up, smiling, you know, and it's kind of become, I have the picture be at my computer desk where I work every day oh, cool. in my office. Um, and I we use it on my, you know, I sort of say to my kids, if you've got exams, if you've got um, performances and this, that and the other, Put your thumbs up, smile, and just get on with it because yeah. he went through a lot worse than what we went through. You know, we yeah. are so lucky compared yeah. to what we went through. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, so we was having a chat about that, and yeah, it was a great show. I thoroughly enjoyed yeah, it. Look forward to it. Look forward to it. So, I mean, whilst before we came on air and before we started recording, we'd been talking about lots of different history 
type yeah. periods. But what would you say your favourite era is to study? Uh, I mean, I told you mine probably is. Well, it's, it's probably uh, I'd say World War Two. I I always was into, and I've gone slightly further back now as I've learnt learnt more. But what would you say your favourite era is? Uh, my favourite's got to be Victorian, mm-hmm. closely followed by the Second World War. Yeah, similar to uh, me then. Yeah. Yeah, those two periods are. You know, uh, people often say I was born at the wrong time. <laughs> why Victorian, though? And then I'll tell you why I, mine is a Victorian. Um, but I love the fact that we've got this kind of um, massive growth. All the cities are expanding. Yeah. Uh, we had these magnificent buildings built. We had the railway coming into play and all these industries. Um, we were inventing stuff. The empire was exploding all over. Um, you know, it was a great prosperous time, but it was also a very dark time. On the flip side of that, we had uh, increasing crime, poverty, murder, you know, so uh, both sides of the coin, really. Um, is but why do I you think the murder was increasing? This is quite, to talk to a historian about this, do you think murder was increasing or do you think it was more documented and more widely it was, documented? It was more documented. I mean, obviously the newspaper tax had decreased around that time, so yeah. there was more newspapers there was also more and more people getting education so more people were reading yeah um so the, the, there was that aspect that these were getting reported I, I was reading a case recently where there was a local murder in hull um within within sort of the space of a day it was picked up by the regional newspapers mm. the following day it was in the national newspapers and the day after that it was published internationally which is just staggering you know mm. and it, there was no internet back then this no. was all done people with the telegrams and you know sending letters and stuff like that yeah uh, you know, so this information was 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 going global you know yeah. it, it was a victorian way of going viral yeah and people were talking about it and this happened in the jack the ripper case you know yeah. the, the case initially um the murders were initially reported locally in, in sort of east end of london mm. then the national events and then international mm. uh, almost to the point where you can see kind of spikes in reporting mm. right through the victorian period yeah where you know, the, the you know the slightest incident you know someone might have been arrested this gets published locally then nationally then internationally mm. then the story dies down again mm. and then you might find there's been another nice scare so it gets reported locally then nationally then international so you'll see another mm. spike and it was like that right throughout all these crimes right yeah. through the victorian period yeah no, um, th- that's what i was saying do you think it is that these these crimes were being committed more frequently or it was just the fact that because they were being reported on not just a local level, more people knew about them. So therefore, it's it's a bit like with crime now, certain crimes now, people say, oh, there's more, you know, horrific child abuse cases. There's more stabbings. There's more this. I just wonder if there is actually more or if it's because of social media, because of the Internet, because of television, because of all the other models that we can use to see what's going on around the world. We yeah, just know more, it. and there's more, yeah, um, and also certain crimes are. Whereas, I mean, one of the the ones we were talking about, one of the murders you you mentioned, um, was a woman who was um, murdered by her husband by being thrown on the fire. Yeah. Um, now he didn't even get the death penalty for that, did he? He he got he basically got deported to the colonies. Yeah. Um, but now that would have been seen as, a, 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 thankfully. <laughs> that would have been seen as a very heinous crime and he would have got a life sentence. Whereas back then it was kind of, ah, it's only your wife almost sort of mentality. So it's also, I think the way we look at certain crimes has changed, but I agree with you about the Victorian piece. It's the reason why, I mean, things like asylums, hospitals, the ragged schools, um, workhouses. I know a lot of people look at them with today's eyes and think how barbaric they were and how horrific they were but it was the victorians trying to improve things you know yeah. trying to you know the only way they could see how and and like with the workhouses yes with today's society yeah of course they were awful but back then if you didn't go into the workhouse you died it's yeah simple as that it was kind of a necessary evil yeah um but you know it's that that and you know the fashions as well and mm. and all that sort of I mean, it's just a, an amazing time um mm. um yeah i mean it, i just love the period mm. you know Same I, here. I have a, Same bit, of, here. a bit of a crush on on sort of queen victoria when she was uh, uh when she was younger 
um, there's some lovely portraits of her when she was in sort of her thirties. Yeah. You know, and she was she was quite a stunning lady. Yeah. And um, you know, I just love the era. Yeah. Um, and then sort of the Second World War. Yeah. It's just because of all the you know I'm really big on bunkers and stuff like that. On a uh-huh. weekend we go out and look for World War Two bunkers and yeah. This weekend we was down in a a bunker that was. Uh, used in the First World War and the Second World War, and then close by to that, we found another bunker that was used during the First World War and the Second cool. World War. Well, and see, then that's, something, that. that's something about Hull I think a lot of people don't realise. Hull was quite badly bombed during World War One, wasn't it, in the Zeppelin raids? Yeah, the Zeppelin raids. They were, they were, again, we're not 100% certain on the number of victims. They say there was around 14 victims. The reason why is that while most people were killed from the bomb dropping, there were some people that were killed after the fact. So people who were running away down the street Mm. We're having heart attack and mm. dropping down dead. And how do you classify that? Would you class that as a... I mean, I, I'd class it as a victim of the Zeppelin raid. Mm. But they were saying, oh, well, it was natural natural causes, so we can't actually put them on the list. Mm. You know, so there were many more deaths than we actually reported on at the time. Mm. Uh, but that, that was a bad time because basically what they'd do is they would fly in over the coast and then they would follow the railway tracks from mm. Hornsey and Witherancy towards Hull and they would just start dropping when they got, you know, towards Hull City Centre. Mm. And you can plot on the map where they kind of flew over. Mm. Um, you know, so it was hit quite badly in that area. We actually had a shop in Hull called Edwin Davids that was hit in the First World War. And they rebuilt it, and it was hit in the Second World War. Um, yeah, you'd think they'd but, learn. They'd learn. Yeah, so <laughs> Change the name or really something. <laughs> oh, really sorry, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not laughing at the fact places were bombed but you know you yeah, kind of have to have a sick sense of humour about these things don't you yeah, but I'm agreeing with you yeah your history periods they're two of my favourites definitely definitely um, for the, the reasons you mentioned as well and yeah. um, I, I say it's it's and it, one of the lovely things about it is you never know it all there's always little exactly. things you find out just by the next time you do the research or talking to someone or and and that's what I love about it. But we were talking about murderers, and I think, well, you've written a book on this gentleman, um, and he has got associations with Hull. And we, I did mention him when I talked to um, my lovely Bill Taboni when we did the Melbourne Jail episode a couple of weeks ago. Frederick Deeming. Yes. Deeming now, what's was... his connection to Hull? Uh, well, basically, in 1889, he was first recorded in Hull uh, at Paragon Station, which is the main train station in Hull. Uh, where he met a gentleman called Thomas Reynoldson, and Thomas Reynoldson was a jeweller, mm-hmm. and he owned a jewellery shop uh, on White Frigate in Hull. And the two became uh, close friends and business associates, and Demon would often go in and buy jewellery and rings and, and uh, silver platters and this kind of stuff. And he started what today we'd call it a long fraud or a long firm. He started using small amounts of money to build up confidence Mm. And then in 1890, just after he bigamously married his second wife in Beverly, which is a town local to Hull, yeah. he went to the jewellery shop and cashed three cheques, just short of £300 worth of stuff. He then got on a, the train from Hull to Southampton, got on a steamer from Southampton to Montevideo. And in the meantime, um, you know, it was a bank holiday weekend, so the bank was closed. But when Mr. Reynoldson goes across to the bank on the Tuesday morning, the account is empty. So he went to the local police authority. The police said, we, we can't do anything about it. So Mr. Reynoldson went to the home office and got permission from the home office for the whole police to go all the way to South America to arrest him and bring him back to Hull, which they did. Right. Um, it was the first time anyone had ever been uh, extradited back to Hull from an international um, port. He was brought to Hull. He stood trial um, and was sent to Hull prison for nine months for fraud. Um, his second wife, discovered that he was married and she wanted to get him done for bigamy but they wouldn't allow that um he was released in july time 1891 and within two weeks of his release mary jane langley was murdered near preston mm-hmm. now which is a, a murder site is about 15 minutes walk from full prison mm-hmm. um she was she had a throat cut a body was buried under a bridge and she had three items of jewelry stolen from her possession Mm-hmm. Um, and then Demon left Hull and went to uh, Raynil, where he murdered wife number one and the four kids. Mm. Um, he then met wife number three, married her and took her to Melbourne, uh, where he killed her as well. Mm. And then 
when he was arrested in 1892 in Australia, he was giving the police the runaround. And it just so happened at that time that the former governor of Hull Prison that had looked after Damien for nine months had retired and was living in Melbourne. Oh, and he right. was able to go forward and say that Damien who was in Hull is also known as um, Harry Lawson and Frederick mm. Denning and has all these aliases, but that's the man who, who you want for the murder. Mm. And it was because of Harry Law, uh, it was because of um, Mr. Webster, who was the governor of Hull Prison, um, that the, the um, identity of Damien was finally revealed. Good. Uh, Good for so, him. You know, yeah, so a lot of little coincidences that all fell into place. Who knows how many other women's lives that man saved by yes. pointing out who Deeming was? Because he was a, well, I think I called him this in my episode with with Bill. He was a narcissistic arsehole, um, yeah. a, a very dark man. And and you you believe you might have had a paranormal experience with Deeming, don't you? Yeah, we vis- we visited a location associated with him some years ago, and and then um, I'd gone for a cup of tea. Uh, the, the paranormal team was investigating the property and they radioed me and said we've just had this name come through the spirit box and it said uh, the demon is here and they were all scared because they thought it was something demonic mm. and demon was a, a nickname for demon that was a mm-hmm. nickname that he used um, and it was a nickname that the press used and you know we were able to make contact with him and we eventually did some glass divination and you know, we were asking him to come through, and we asked him if, if he was demon, and he said yes. And we asked him to move the glass, and it we heard a physical, audible, like someone yelling no in the back of the room. And mm. everybody, everybody in that room was kind of, you know, they were all on tensor ups, and they wanted to get out of the room as quick as possible. Mm. And as we were leaving the room, we were about twelve foot away from the the table where the glass was, and you could hear the glass moving. And we turned around, and the glass had a little red LED light in, so you could see it in the darkness. Mm. And it moved off the table quite slowly and then flew across the room and smashed into the wall. And by that point, everybody was ready to leave the building. Uh, so, yeah, and I was told for a long, you know, I have a lot of lot of friends that work with me that are kind of spiritual and mm-hmm. mediums and spiritualists. And I work locally with a church. And they sort of said to me at one point, it, it's almost like this guy's following you around because mm-hmm. um, you've told his story. You've, you've finally revealed what he's like. Mm. And um, you know, it did get quite heated at one point. I remember one point shouting out loud, um, "All the money that I make from the book, I'm going to use it to build a memorial to your victims, and I'm going to make sure you're not even mentioned on it." Mm. You know, there was a lot of stuff going on, and you know, it was a weird, weird experience. Mm. Well, like, like I said to Bill, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if Deeming was one of the the pe- one of the spirits, if you like, haunting the jail, because. Yep. You know, for anyone else who anyone who didn't listen to that show I did on Melbourne, shame on you. Go and listen to it now. Well, not now when we finish this show, but obviously. Um, but Deeming was also one of the people who he reckoned, or it said that just before he was executed, he said he was Jack. He intim- intimated he was Jack the Ripper, and yeah. and the, one of the sort of conversations Bill and I were having was, well, firstly, neither of us believe he was Jack the Ripper because. I think when some of the Ripper murders were conducted, Deeming was elsewhere. So I don't think there's any chance logistically in that day and age where you didn't exactly have fast jets to get you from one part to another. He couldn't have done it. But it was more of an arrogance thing and him wanting him being a narcissist and him wanting everyone to know who he was by making people think he could have been, you know, one of the most albeit not one of the most prolific murderers of all time, but one of the most famous yeah. murderers of all time. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Mike, as an expert um, in both Jack the Ripper and Deeming? Uh, well, he, I mean, he, the, the book I've written on him comes to the conclusion that he wasn't Jack the Ripper, but he was someone hell of a lot worse. Mm. Um, you know, his, his victim count was enormous. And yet, if you pick any book up on murders, it very rarely mentions Deeming. No. Um, you know, this was a guy that killed two of his wives and four of his kids. Mm. And, you know, was wanted for, for fraud and bigamy. And, you know, the, every, everybody whose life he touched, he, he ruined, you know, or, or tried to. Um, he just left a trail of destruction behind. Mm. And yet, Didn't he bury very his bad. wife and kids under the fireplace or something? It, um, wife number one and the four children were buried under the concrete floor 
of uh, a villa uh, in Rainhill. Mm. And then uh, wife number three, she was buried under the fireplace in uh, Australia, in Windsor. Right. So if he hadn't been caught, his his body count could have been even higher. A lot higher. Mm. Yeah. 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 No, he's. I just. I just think he was very. He was a psychopath. At the end yeah. of the day, he was a. He was a bona fide psychopath. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if he still haunts places because. Well, he likes to cause chaos. Um, yeah. There's a great story in the courtroom where Damon stood up, and said. Um, you know, you, I'm I'm insane. Um, I spent time in mental institutions, and I see the ghost of my mum, and she tells me to murder people. And his own brother Albert actually stood up in the courtroom and said he's lying. <laughs> um, you know, even his own family at that time were speaking out mm-hmm. against him. Um, you know, and they went on record as saying that Damon was lying about his mental attitude and mm-hmm. and stuff. Like that. So, so yeah. that was quite a, a yeah. an sort of an important. Um, case yeah at break for him. he was a horrible man horrible horrible man um right let's let's leave deeming to one side i you know i don't don't want to mention his name anymore um yeah. but anyone who does want to read up on him mike has written a really good book on it that's on my to-do list to read it's on my kindle all set up to read when i finish the one i'm reading at the moment um but let's 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 jump to um, sort of March of 1941 and Hull. Now, yeah. one of the things that I, I, sort of, I was saying to Mike that I like to do is to educate people who don't know much about history. You probably guessed that from listening to my show, seeing as half of you think I'm going to put you on detention if you're late listening to it or whatever. That I'm, I'm not a teacher. I just love to help people learn more. And one of the things that I love to explain to people is that when you mention the word the, the Blitz and World War Two, people associate it with London and only London. What they don't realise is that Blitzkrieg or the Lightning War, as it translates to in English, was actually nationwide. It wasn't just London that was hit. And they believe, the statistics say that Hull was the most damaged town in the UK due to the Blitz. Now, looking at statistics, people still think of London. Now, London had the most sustained attacks on it. Um, and I've got some of the statistics from some of the hits that were, were done. So, so on the, I think it was the 7th of, it was the, even, the night of the 7th of May in, in Hull, um, something like 110 tonnes of bombs were dropped and 9,648 incendiary bombs the following night 157 tons of bombs were dropped and nearly 19 and a half thousand incendiary devices two days later in london 711 tons of bombs were dropped but only 2400 incendiary so there was obviously a lot more incendiary bombs dropped on hull in comparison to what was dropped on london but then when you look at the population figures, the numbers start to pale into insignificance, really, because London at a time, in a London, had something in the region of four million people living there. Hull, 302,000. So I think when you start to look at the bombs per head, so to speak, that's a bad analogy, but you can see the the devastation that was rained down on Hull in that tiny period alone what would you add to that mike as a historian um i mean this was based this was one of the darkest periods of our history in hull mm. uh, and this is this is a town that you know like we said earlier had been bombed in the first world war we'd gone through outbursts of the plague and the cholera mm-hmm. um but this is basically this this whole period right between sort of 1939 when we had the phony war and stuff like that mm. um, we were kind of building up to this moment and we started putting these uh, shelters around Hull, mm. many communal shelters because obviously a lot of the communities didn't have room in the back gardens for mm. these smaller garden shelters. And you had a lot of social housing in Hull as well didn't you? It was yeah there was a mm. lot of social houses um, and eventually what happened by the end of the blitz over 3,000 people in Hull were injured and mm. um, around 1,200 people were killed 
Now, mm. we don't know the exact number. Mm. And it, this is going to sound shocking, but after the raids, people from the ARP were sent out with buckets mm. and asked to pick up body parts. Yeah. And these couldn't be identified. So we say around 1,200 deaths because a lot of people went missing. We mm. don't know if they died from the war, yeah. um, from the bombing. So there was this really dark period where you know all this was going on. At the end of the Blitz, 86,175 houses in Hull were damaged. Mm. Um, that left just 5,945. Was it something like ninety five percent of houses? About ninety five percent, yeah. Um, yeah. one hundred and fifty two thousand people were temporary homeless. Um, yeah. We went through eight hundred and fifteen alerts. Um, there was over a thousand hours spent in the air raids shelters under these air, um, raids. Yeah. Eighty two air raids we suffered, um, and that might be anywhere from one plane to a whole fleet of of planes. Mm. Um, 250 domestic shelters were destroyed across the city. Mm. 120 communal shelters were destroyed. Are you looking um, at my crib sheet that I've written my notes down on? I promise we what, haven't got a camera. He can't see what I've written, but those are the exact numbers I've written down. Yeah, this, this is the stuff that I've I've got. Um, I'm actually working on a book at the moment, so this is from my manuscript. I'm just going through all the, the facts and stuff. Um, in On June 1940 was the first uh, incident when an explosion was caused uh, by gunfire mm. um, in in Marfleet, which is just down the road from Hull, which is a, it used to be a village on the outskirts of Hull, but now we've kind of um, assimilated it into Hull. Yeah. Um, the first daylight attack took place on July first in East Hull, East Hull um, which is where I live. Mm-hmm. The last air raid uh, on Hull took place just down the road from where I live. Um, and that was in 1945, and that was in March 1945. So when people thought the war was over, mm. um, Hull was still suffering. Mm. Uh, and basically what happened was um, a German bomber uh, on March 17, 1945, flew over uh, Hull, and it flew up the, the, the river Hull. It turned round and came back to East Hull, chasing the um, railway lines, and then when it got over the civilian population, it started dropping bombs. Mm. Now, it hit a number of streets along what we, we know as Holderness Road. And at that time, the air raid sirens had gone off 30 minutes before. So people were still kind of coming out the cinema mm. um, and the bombs started dropping. Now, basically what happened was nobody thought the air raid was legitimate. Mm. So nobody really was rushing or panicking. or you know. So it was only when the bombs started dropping that people realised this was a genuine event. Mm. Um, the first responders that turned up were ill-equipped because as far as they were aware, we were winning the war. There was no chance of another air raid. Yeah. Um, you know, so they turned up without blood, uh, sorry, without beds, um, mm. without sheets, without blankets, uh, without first aid equipment. Uh, the uh, the closest first aid post was around about a quarter of a mile away mm. um, down the road itself. But the road had been hit so badly that transport on the road had stopped. Mm. Um, you know, the initial reports showed um, who had been killed. Um, and this ranges from, you know, a two-year-old girl called Pamela Winter all the way up to a 60-year-old gentleman uh, called Walter Coggle. Mm. Um, on my street, a couple of doors down from where I live, a gentleman called John McLeod was killed. He was 73. Mm. Um, and he was basically, he'd, he'd been at his house had gone to the cinema, and when the sirens went off, he took a slow walk home and the bombs had dropped. Mm. And basically what they did was they, they got all the bodies of the deceased and they laid them out at the top of my street. And there was blood all over. There was trying to get the street back to normal. They was trying to fix the road. And this was 9 o'clock at night. Mm. So, you know, great panic um, followed. Um, one of the most interesting ones was Lillian Martin and George Martin were walking down the street and when they were killed, they lost their hands. Now, Lillian was 41, uh, George was 33, they were husband and wife, and they lived locally. And the official report said it would be nice to think that they were holding hands, that their last moment on air, they were spent holding hands. And, you know, it, it was such... Uh, it basically, it, it caused an outcry because everybody was so ill-prepared. There was mm. a massive investigation... Um, you know, it took quite a while for people to kind of get to the bottom of what happened. 
Mm. Um, so right through the war, we were hit. And I mean, some of these raids were, you know, what we did to kind of be a bit sneaky around the Germans. Further east of Hull were fields, and we set up a what we, we know as the the mock dock. Mm. And this was basically a, a system of lights and pools of water. And when the sirens went off in Hull, the real lights at the docks would turn off. And then the fake lights at the fake docks would turn on. So mm. when the Germans flew over at height, looking out the window, they would think that they were bombing docks, but in actual fact they were bombing fields. Yeah. Um, so we had that kind of going on at the time. Yeah, there was quite a few um, decoy sites like that around the UK. I know yeah. there was I know there was one, um, I think it was Essex Way, uh, or maybe it was Norfolk. It was one or the other. I wasn't expecting us to mention this because I, otherwise I'd have checked. But yeah, there was there was one, it was a, it yeah. was a, a mock sort of industrial sort of site to try and draw them away and i think i think i think one of the stories that i found i mean you mentioned about ferron's way when you were talking about yeah. sugs um and you had the was it the shell mex building yeah now what the i shell have to mex. say before we talk about this is mike did a, I, I i you know i always give credit to people who've done the articles mike did a brilliant article for one of the whole newspapers which i'm going to put the link up on the parasearch page for anyone who wants to read it after this after this show because it's a really interesting article and it talks about the five most horrific air raid sort of um, so it's fatalities situations during World War Two in Hull. And one of them is the Shelmex building um, in Ferron's Way. Now, is this where Hammond's was that you were talking about? It was just across the road from Hammond's. Um, this was basically the Shelmex building was a private building. It was owned by the Shell Company. Um, and this was where the ARP command centre um, was set up. So this was responsible for all the messages from cyclist messengers, mm-hmm. all the incidents that were recorded during these bombing raids, or everything would go back to this one building. Um, and inside that building, you had the uh, deputy director for medical health in Hull, who was called Dr. David Diamond. Um, he was there with his wife. Uh, other people that were there were PC Garton. Um, and basically, when the sirens went off, PC got and ran up to Ferrens where opened the doors, ushered people into the shelter, uh, and then the bomb dropped. Mm. And what's weird about the building is that all the wood and internal structure collapsed, but the stone brick structure outside remained, and it's still there to this day. They've put new flooring in, and it's now offices for the job centre. Mm. Um, so they managed to save the building. But the real tragedy is that this resulted in the death of several people, including Susan Wood and their children, um, they were all killed, but also PC Garton. It, the last thing anyone ever saw of PC Garton was him running up those steps onto Ferenberg when the bombs dropped. Mm-hmm. Now, what happened with him was quite interesting because in the official report, it just said that they found bits of black leather boot and navy blue trousers. Now, for years and years after that, these ladies that used to work in the, the job centre would go down into the basement and they said that the stairs are still there but they're capped off now with a concrete um, sort of ceiling. Right. And she said on occasion that the ladies have gone down there and heard footsteps and looked across and they've seen black leather boots, navy blue trousers and nothing else walking up the stairs and just wow. vanishing. And it, they came to me with that information before we knew about Garten. And we went to them and said, you know, it looks like it's BC Garten. And the last thing he did on air was, was heroic. You know, he ran yeah, up there to save all these definitely. people's lives. The bomb dropped and he was completely wiped off the face of the air. And yet there's no plaque there, there's no memorial, there's nothing there to talk about the bravery. That, Wrong, really, that isn't he... it? Has anyone ever tried to communicate with him? Uh, well, the problem is that we have at the moment now is that it's in the middle of the, the job centre. Um, you know, so it's quite awkward getting access. Right. Um, also, when you kind of tell them that you want to get in touch with a, a gentleman that was killed 70 years ago. Um, but I have asked... Uh, and so far, I've not been able to. But it, it is. I, I keep asking. I keep asking. Yeah. But who knows in the future? Oh, well, keep me posted on that one. Keep me posted on that one. Okay. Another one that that got me, and there's a reason why this one got me. That was in that article was Ellis Terrace. Yeah. Now again, a communal shelter. Um, I believe it was opposite East Hull Baths. Is that East correct? Hull Baths. Yeah. Now, 
your article names the families that were wiped out in this this one and this one and there is a reason why one of the family names actually resonates with me but you had the adamsons the bowdens or bowdens however it's pronounced the boylans yeah. the walkers the middletons the richardsons the shaws and the danbys now my mum's maiden name is danby yeah and it's not a very common name really it's a yorkshire this name was... but it's not a yeah. mega common name and the Danby family was one of the families that was wiped out in this particular incident. Yeah, this this was a terrace that was set up of... There was 20 houses on that terrace. Um, and when the sirens went off, they all, all the families from all the houses went into the communal shelter and the communal shelter got hit. Mm. Um, there was only a handful of people that died in the properties, but most of them died in the shelter. And amongst those in the shelter were was Lottie Muriel Danby. She was 48 and William Danby, who was 49, and they lived at 15 Alice Terrace. And um, this, again, you know, when the bomb dropped, this was an entire community wiped out, mm. you know, children. According to reports, the youngest victim in that raid was two years old. He was called Brian Adamson, and he was a member of the Adams family, and he'd gone in there with his mum and dad, uh, and they lived at number four, ter uh, Alice Terrace. But earlier in the day, there was a, a midwife who helped deliver a baby on Ellis Terrace, and that baby wasn't yet registered. So when the bomb dropped, that baby was killed before it even got a chance to be re registered oh, on the file. Um, and we know this because there was a, a fantastic uh, documentary made some years ago by a gentleman called Ron Fairfax, and Ron used to be one of my teachers at school, mm -hmm. uh, and we still keep in touch. Now we still talk about history, and he's a lovely guy. And he made this documentary, and he spoke to the lady who was... Um, the midwife all these years ago and she said she remembers delivering the baby getting on a bike cycling down Oldness Road hearing the explosion turning around and just seeing this you know streak of light and flames and rushing back and Ellis Terrace had gone um, you know and again what was interesting about that particular raid and what was quite ghastly um, 22 sets of remains were discovered but after the fact um, bodies were being pulled from the top of the swimming pool roof um, human remains were found, including a scalp of a lady and a hand oh. of someone else. And we don't know who these belong to. And the roof is some distance away. But again, this this is an interesting one for me because I, when I was asked, when I was researching this, I was talking to a guy who was a builder. And I first became aware of this story many, many years ago. This builder was working on the site of what is now St. Stephen's in Fulham. And he would cycle home along Oldenness Road on his push bike at the end of his shift. And one night he was on his way home and it was pouring down with rain and he was riding along um, what we know as Witham and he got a puncture. So by the time he got to this, um, there's a bus shelter on the site now. He put his bike underneath the shelter and he called his wife up. And back then this was a garage forecourt, even though the garage was empty and no one works there. Um, and he, he called his wife and said, will you come and pick me up? I've got a puncture. It's pouring down with rain. And he heard someone crying behind him and he looked around the bus shelter and there was no one there and he said it sounded like a girl so he got his bike with the bike light switched on mm. and walked round to the garage forecourt to illuminate the forecourt and there was no one there and he could hear people crying he could hear this woman crying and he could hear ba babies crying and he said the noise came to a crescendo and it stopped and I, that that to me was really interesting and i sort of said to him when did it happen and he said oh well this was on april 16th which was the anniversary of the ellis terry bombing so, so where's Ellis that, Terrace in relation to where this happened? Ellis Terrace, uh, the 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 the, the um, garage was built on the top of the site of what Ellis Terrace used to be. Oh, so Ellis Terrace doesn't exist anymore. It's no longer there now. It's just right. uh, at the moment this car's parked on there. Right. Um, a few years ago, we actually went in the middle of the night and planted loads of poppy seeds, right. so that the poppies come out and stuff like that on the site but now it's a it's almost a, a garage forecourt right. for the used cars there's, again there's no plaque there there's nothing to say that the incident happened there um and it's a shame really because like, again this was an entire community yeah that was lost. yeah are the baths still there then what was east hull baths uh the, the east hull baths are still there but the council just closed them um right. sort of the past six months so now that building's empty as well so has anyone uh, ever reported anything there. Oh yeah, across the road, across the road in the baths, people have reported stuff. 
and next door was a really old library and people reported stuff in there and those buildings were joined together and the body parts were found on the top of those buildings so what kind um, of things are people reported experiencing there um, phantom footsteps um you know wet footprints when there's no one around um you know small stuff not like really i don't think anyone's ever seen an apparition or anything like that right uh, Years and years ago, the library was opened up for paranormal investigation, and a group went in there and and reported that they'd heard footsteps and people crying and gasps and, and this sort of stuff. Um, but in recent years, it was turned into a flat. People live in there now. Mm. Um, I've not had any reports just yet, um, but I'm keeping my ears open. I'll bet. I'll bet. Well, the last one I want to mention, because we're in our hours not not long to go, is the city square incident. Again, yeah. a communal shelter. Um, question the logic of communal shelters because all it would take was one hit on one and, hun- you know, a lot of people could be killed in one fell swoop. But there was a myth with the City Square incident that there was a load of bodies buried yeah. in the basement rather than be recovered. Yeah. How did this myth start? What What's the basis of it? Well, basically what happened was this communal air raid shelter was underneath a massive old bank called the Prudential Buildings. And part of this bank had a tower, which was known as Prudential Tower. Mm -hmm. And directly underneath was this communal air raid shelter. And what happened was, again, the air raid sirens went off. um, All these people ran across the road and they, they went into the shelter. The bomb dropped, hit the shelter directly. The building collapsed and the tower was still standing. But then the decision was made to pull the tower because it was leaning dangerously. Mm-hmm. Um, there were reports at the time that the fire brigade had drowned the victims, that the, the bodies were buried underneath the rubble. Uh, and this went on for about 16 years. Um, and it was only when I sort of started researching this, I joined a project called the World War II Project. Mm-hmm. And the, the head of the archives at that time was a guy called Martin Taylor. And he was going through all this documentation, getting it ready for us to um, type it all up and transcribe everything getting it all digitised to be able to put online. And he himself found this report that said in the middle of the night, under the cover of darkness, that they went in and retrieved the bodies and brought them back out. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it kind of dissolves that myth. But mm-hmm. again, the, the, there's a really, really sad in, incident here is that one of those families, the Wallace family, they were from the nearby Punch Hotel. And they left the Punch Hotel to go to the tower and when the bomb dropped, Frederick Wallace, who was 54, Catherine Wallace, who was 48, Barbara Jane, who was 11, and Frederick Henry, who was 15, they were all killed. If they'd have stayed in the Punch Hotel, they would have been okay. The Punch mm-hmm. Hotel still stands. And it's mm-hmm. such a cruel twist of fate, you know, and it, it just goes to show that it, it, it doesn't matter where you are, really. You know, time is up. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's your time, it's your time. Mm-hmm. Um, now, to anyone listening who's saying, like, I don't remember them ever mentioning it about Hull being bombed. I don't remember them saying Hull in any of the newspapers from the time. Reason being is places like Hull were rarely identified by the government as being places that had been hit. And you probably know this, Mike. Um, yeah. Whether it was to do with keeping British morale up, whether it was to do with making sure the enemy didn't know that their targeting systems were accurate, yeah, it could be any of those, all of the above. But places like Hull tended to be put as a northern eastern town or a northern town or a northern coastal town. So to keep it kind of secret, and it was only when one of your museums, I believe, was blown up that Hull was actually identified as being the place that it had happened in. So, you know, don't all I say is don't always trust what you read. Dig into it. Because there's normally a lot more going on behind the scenes than you may know about. And this is, I'm sure you're the same, Mike. This is one of the things I've found about history, that when you start digging into stuff, more information comes to light that, that on the face of it, you didn't know. Would yeah. that be accurate? And it, there is a lot more stuff being found all the time. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I've been going through stuff um, the past few weeks uh, about sort of World War Two uh, bunkers, mm-hmm. and we actually found one that's still in existence that everyone had forgotten about. Mm-hmm. And not only did we find it, we were granted permission to go down and have a look at it, wow. uh, which was a great honour. It was fantastic, and we ended up filming down there with the BBC. We took the cameras down and, and showed awesome. you know, the cameras around. 
Um, and nobody knew this existed. We, we all thought this had disappeared and gone. And so there is new stuff being found all the time. And it, it, it might be something that people think is really insignificant. But in actual fact, in the grand scheme of things, it could be a vital piece of some historical jigsaw. Yeah. You know, that yeah. we've not yet put together. Uh, so, I like I always say to people, keep researching. You know, I, I, I write five days a week, but I reset five days a week as well. And the amount of days I spend in the archives is unbelievable. And I'm finding new stuff all the time, you know, and it, it opens up new areas of avenue. And some of it might not be relevant at the time, mm. but then later on, you might be researching something completely different. Mm-hmm. And the kind of pieces of that that jigsaw fall in, and that vital piece of research that you've yep. kind of, you know, disregarded at the time might become more important. Um, you know, and I found that a lot. I do find that, you know, a lot of the stuff that I write about at the time, the the Marfleet murder mystery was a book that I was never going to write. It was never mm-hmm. a, a project that I wanted to work on. But it just so happens that when the family came to me, I saw I was really busy with demon. Mm. And sort of said, I've not really got time to do this to another project on this, this scale. And it was only when I was researching Damon that I found a newspaper report that linked him to the Marfleet murder mystery. Mm. And a massive coincidence, mm-hmm. but it was almost like the, the story was there for me to tell. It, I just needed that extra nudge. Um, you know, and when I found that report uh, and started researching it and writing about it for the family, um, you know, and in the end, I presented the family with my research and they said, why don't you release it as a book? And I published it as a book, and it was one of yeah. the first books I thought to Holly, I sold to Hollywood to be turned into a movie. Yeah. So I, I do believe stuff happens for a, a reason, yeah. you know, and, and it's it's why I love doing what I do. I spend all day researching and writing, and I, I find it fascinating. No, I've got, you're, t- you're preaching to the converted there, here, Mike. <laughs> Absolutely preaching to the converted. So you've got a new book coming out soon, I take it. You've got a new book coming out I, soon? I, I've just published three this year. Three this year? <laughs> yeah, okay. I've just published... Uh, three this year and I've just submitted the new manuscript for the next book um, to my publisher um, he he messaged me just this morning actually to say that he was reading it um, okay. and this is this is another one in the Mike Covell Investigate series awesome. um, and this one's looking at the, the whole UFO files Okay. Uh, so this is part of a massive series that we're working on that's looking at sort of the weirder side of Hull's history Okay, um, awesome. Um, so, you, so we've got it, that coming out. We've got that coming out at mid next year, late next year. I don't know when that'll be due out. It's, I've just got an email from him just this minute, actually. <laughs> um, he's, he's just put his he's, uh, he's reading it. He's getting to work on it, and he's excited. So cool, that's always what, um, always what you want to hear. Always what you want to hear. Yeah, it, we, we usually work really quick because ah, right. although my publisher is based in, I think he's in Finland at the moment. He, he travels all over the world. We have kind of a, a really interesting relationship. He'll send me pictures of what he thinks will make a good book cover. And at the same time, I'll email him pictures of what I think will make a good book cover. And 99% of the, the time, we have the same idea. Sweet. So we have this really amazing kind of relationship where we both have a vision of what we want to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there is a pattern. If you look at the Jack, all the Jack the Ripper books, they're all street scenes. Yeah. If you look true crime books I've done they're all scenes from overhead yeah. and then if you look at the investigate series they're all scenes of um, churches and drains and very yeah. dark areas. Um, and that that's the idea is that we're going to have that running right through the theme um, and we, we do we do work on that a lot but yeah there's a lot more stuff on the way okay um, and you've got the television show that you've just filmed with Suggs that yeah be... that should I'm not sure when that's going to wear, actually, but that should be any time. That will be um, for the second series of World War II Treasure Hunters. Okay. So well, when you know your air date for that one, Mike, do let us know, and we can share yes, it ma'am. on the Parasearch pages so people can, can watch that as well. But if anyone wants to get in contact with Mike, he's quite easy to contact using Facebook or his website, all of those kind of things. Um like I say, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Mike. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed. Say, it's always it is always nice to talk to a fellow historian <laughs> who doesn't <laughs> think I'm I'm weird when I start waxing lyrical about different things. Um, oh, most people me. just start snoring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm sure we'll ask you to come back on at another point, and we can talk about some more stuff as I get through more of your books as I'm reading them but do go and check out Amazon all that kind of thing for Mike's books they're really really interesting and and what I like about his Mike Investigates 
series is he does he's it's, again he's a man after my own heart he looks at the facts as well as the hauntings kind of like my show really um so i think you know i think we must have been separated at birth as well mike because we've got the same <laughs> outlook on things but do go and check out all his books drop him a line if you if you've got any questions for him i'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer them for you but all that leaves me to say is don't forget parasearch radio has shows on six nights of the week catch up with all of them on spreaker on youtube whichever is your preference we don't care as long as you have a listen and let us know what you think and that probably until next week my friends until next week have a good evening sleep tight and don't worry too much about things that go bump in the night thank you for listening don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week find us on facebook twitter and the world wide web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on parasearch radio